Hello again, welcome back to the Liam Maxwell podcast. Uh, I've recently read an incredible book called How to Change Your Mind, The New Science of Psychedelics by Michael Pollan. This book just blew me away. I finished reading it a few weeks back now and I've been meaning to do this podcast for, well, since then because I just want to get this information out there. The, the, I'm going to read a bit out of the book in a little bit. Uh, and the bit I'm going to read is the very ending of, of the book, the last chapter, and um, just the last segment of the last chapter. And I'd love to to know what you guys think about it. Um, I mean, psychedelics really are seemingly the medicine or one of the most promising new medicines of the future. I mean, we've known about LSD and uh, MDMA and these types of, of things, mushrooms, for centuries, but ayahuasca and DMT and these things. But uh, they've been suppressed and, um, well, the government has regulated them since the 60s and they realised that people were opening their minds up too much and um, I guess people were, were abusing the drugs uh, and so that didn't give them a good look at all. But they really do have incredible he uh, healing properties and powers and these medicines, we shouldn't call them, you know, for example, magic mushrooms. It's a, that's, a, that's not a term we should be using. We should be calling it, you know, medicinal psilocybin. That's That's what it really is uh so one of the one of the uh praises for this book came from Yuval Noah Harari who I'm actually reading he was the author of Sapiens and or is the author of the book called Sapiens and I'm reading his book at the moment called 21 Lessons for the 21st Century which is another fascinating book highly recommend it but uh this book by Michael Pollan how to change your mind he, he says, uh, Yuval Noah Harari commented on it and said, reminds us that the mind is the greatest mystery in the universe. And that's so true because we really don't know a whole lot about our own mind, our own minds. Uh, it's such a mystery to us still. We, we really are only just beginning to understand the complexities and the intricacies of our unique minds and and just what the human mind is truly capable of and it's absolutely incredible and empowering to know or to be able to live in a time where we're beginning to find these things out through science and so I'm going to read the last segment of this uh, last chapter of this book and just just listen attentively and uh, I'd love for you to comment or just even just think to yourself, what what do you take from this? What what's your opinion on this? And you know what what do you get out of this? Because I got so much out of it. This was one of the most well written pieces of writing I think I've ever read. To be honest, I I loved. I was just gripped. It's not it's not very often. I read a lot of books. It's not very often that I'm gripped by a book, but uh, this one certainly had me. So here we go. <clears throat> I, for one, sincerely hope that the kinds of experiences I've had on psychedelics will not be limited to sick people and will someday become more widely available. Does that mean I think these drugs should simply be legalised? Not exactly. It is true I had a very positive experience using psilocybin recreationally, on my own, that is, without the support of a guide, and for some people this might be fine. But sooner or later, it seems, everyone has a trip for which bad is far too pallid a modifier. I would hate to be alone when that happens. For me, working one-on-one -on -one with an experienced guide in a safe place removed from my everyday life turned out to be the ideal way to explore, explore psychedelics. Yet there are other ways to structure the psychedelic journey. To provide a safe container for its potentially overwhelming energies. Ayahuasca and peyote are typically used in a group with the leader, often but not necessarily a shaman, acting in a supervisory role and helping people to navigate and interpret their experiences. 
But whether individually or in a group, the presence of someone with training and experience who can hold the space, to use that hoary new age locution, is more meaningful and comforting than I would have imagined. Not only did my guides create a setting in which I felt safe enough to surrender to the psychedelic experience, but they also helped me to make sense of it afterward. Just as important, they helped me to see there was something here worth making sense of. This is by no means self-evident. It is all too easy to dismiss what unfolds in our minds during a psychedelic journey as simply a drug experience, and that is precisely what our culture encourages us to do. Matt Johnson made this point the first time we spoke. Let's say you have some 19-year-olds taking mushrooms at a party. One of them has a profound experience. He's come to understand what God is, or his connection to the universe. What do his friends say? Oh man, you had too much last night. No more mushrooms for you. Sorry, I just need to quickly put do not disturb on. Done. Were you drinking or on drugs, is what our culture says when you, have a powerful, when you have a powerful experience. Yet even a moment's reflection tells you that attributing the content of the psychedelic experience to drugs explains virtually nothing about it. The images and narratives and the insights don't come from nowhere, and they certainly don't come from a chemical. They come from inside our minds, and at the very least have something to tell us about that. If dreams and fantasies and free associations are worth interpreting, then surely so is the more vivid and detailed material with which the psychedelic journey presents us. It opens a new door on one's mind. And about that, and about that, my psychedelic journeys have taught me a great many interesting things. Many of these were the kinds of things one might learn in the course of psychotherapy. Insights into important relationships, the outlines of fears and desires ordinarily kept out of view, repressed memories and emotions, and, perhaps most interesting and useful, a new perspective on how one's mind works. This, I think, is the great value of exploring non-ordinary states of consciousness. The light they reflect back on the ordinary ones, which no longer seem quite so transparent or so ordinary. To realise, as William James concluded, that normal waking consciousness is but one of many potential forms of consciousness, ways of perceiving or constructing the world, separated from it by merely the, film, the filmiest of screens, is to recognise that our account of reality, whether inward or outward, is incomplete at best. Normal waking consciousness might seem to offer a faithful map to the territory of reality, and it is good for many things, but it is only a map, and not the only map. As to why these other modes of consciousness exist, we can only speculate. Most of the time, it is normal waking consciousness that best serves the interests of survival and is most adaptive. But there are moments in the life of an individual or a community when the imaginative novelties proposed by altered states of consciousness introduce exactly the sort of variation that can send a life or a culture down a new path. For me, the moment I recognised the tenuousness and relativity of my own default consciousness came that afternoon on Fritz's mountaintop when he taught me how to, how to enter a trance state by means of nothing more than a pattern of rapid breathing and the sounds of rhythmic drumming. Where in the world has that been all my life? This is nothing Freud or any number of psychologists and behavioural economists haven't told us, but the idea that normal consciousness <clears throat> is but the tip of a large and largely uncharted psychic iceberg is now for me something more than a theory. The hidden vastness of the mind is a felt reality. I don't mean to suggest I have achieved this state of ego transcending awareness, only tasted it. These experiences don't last, or at least they didn't for me. After each of my psychedelic sessions came a period of several weeks in which I felt noticeably different, more present to the moment, much less inclined to dwell on what's next. I was also notably more emotional and surprised, and surprised myself on several occasions by how little it took me to, to tear up or smile. I found myself thinking about things like death and time and infinity, but less in angst than in wonder. I spent an unreasonable amount of time reflecting on how improbable and fortunate it is to be living here and now at the frontier of two, and two eternities of non-existence. All at once and unexpectedly, waves of compassion or wonder or pity would wash over me. This was a way of being I treasured, but alas, every time it eventually faded. 
It's difficult not to slip back into the familiar grooves of mental habit. They are so well worn. The tidal pull of what the Buddhists call our habit energies is difficult to withstand. Add to this the expectations of other people, which subtly enforce a, a certain way of being yourself, no matter how much you might want to attempt another. After a month or so, it was pretty much back to baseline. But not quite. Not completely. For much like the depressed patients I interviewed in London, who described being nourished and even inspired by their furloughs from the cage of depression, the experience of some other way of being in the world survives in memory as a possibility and a destination. For me, the psychedelic experience opened a door to a specific mode of consciousness that I can now occasionally recapture in meditation. I'm speaking of a certain cognitive space that opens up late in a trip or in the midst of a mild one. A space where you can entertain all sorts of thoughts and scenarios without reaching for any kind of resolution. It somewhat resembles hypnagogic consciousness, that liminal state perched on the edge of sleep when all kinds of images and scraps of story briefly surface before floating away. But this is sustained, and what comes up can be clearly recalled. And through the images, and though the images and ideas that appear are not under di your direct control, but rather seem to be arriving and departing of their own accord, you can launch a topic or change it like a channel. The ego is not entirely absent. You haven't been blasted into particles or have returned from that particular state, but the stream of consciousness is taking its own desultory course and you are bobbing and drifting along with it, looking neither forward nor back, immersed in the currents of, ra of being rather than doing. And yet a certain kind of mental work is getting done and occasionally I have emerged from the state with usable ideas, images or metaphors. <clears throat> my psychedelic adventures familiarise me with this mental territory and sometimes, not always, I find I can return to it during my daily meditation. I don't know if this is exactly where I'm supposed to be where I'm, when I'm meditating, but I'm always happy to find myself floating in this particular mental stream. I would never have found it if not for psychedelics. This strikes me as one of the great gifts of the experience they afford the expansion of one's repertoire of conscious states. Just because the psychedelic journey takes place entirely in one's mind doesn't mean it isn't real. It is an experience and, for some of us, one of the most profound a person can have. As such, it takes its place as a feature in the landscape of a life. It can serve as a reference point, a guidepost, a wellspring, and, for some, a kind of spiritual sign or shrine. For me, the experiences have become landmarks to circle around and interrogate for meaning. Meanings about myself, obviously, but also about the world. Several of the images that appeared in the course of my trips I think about all the time, hoping to unwrap what feels like a gift of meaning. From where or what or whom, I cannot say. There was that steel pylon ho hovering over the landscape of self or the image of my grandfather's skull staring back at me in Mary's mirror, the majestic but, ho but now hollowed-out trees in which my parents appeared to me, liable to topple in the next windstorm, or the inky well of Yo-Yo Ma's cello resonating with Bach's warm embrace of death. But there is one other image I haven't shared that I keep thinking must contain some important teaching, even as it continues to mystify me. My last psychedelic journey was on ayahuasca, I was invited to join a circle of women who gather every three or four months to work with a legendary guide, a woman in her 80s who had trained under Leo Zeff. She in turn had trained Mary, the woman who guided my psilocybin journey. This journey was different from the others in that it took place in the company of a dozen other travellers, all of them strangers to me. <clears throat> Befitting this particular psychedelic, which is a tea brewed from two Amazonian plants, one a vine, the other a leaf. There was a considerable amount of ceremony in the shamanic mode, the singing of traditional ikaros, prayers and invocations to the grandmother, aka the plant teacher, or ayahuasca, bells and rattles and shakapas, and the blowing on us of various scents and, smell and smokes, all of which contributed to a mood of deep mystery and a suspension of, of disbelief that was especially welcome, inasmuch as we were in a yoga studio a long way from any jungle. As, as has been the case with all of my journeys, 
The night before had been sleepless, as part of me worked to convince the rest of me not to do this crazy thing. That part was of course my ego, which before every trip has fought the threat to its integrity with ferocity and ingenuity, planning doubts and scenarios of disaster I had trouble battling away. What about your heart, pal? You could die. What if you lose your lunch, or even worse, your shit? And what if the grandmother dredges up some childhood trauma? Do you really want to lose it among these strangers, these women? Part of the power of the ego flows from its command of one's rational faculties. By the time I arrived for the circle, I was a nervous wreck, assailed by second and third thoughts as to the wisdom of what I was about to do. But, as has happened every time, as soon as I swallowed the medicine and slipped past the point of no return, the voice of doubt went quiet and I surrendered to whatever was in store, which was not unlike my other psychedelic experiences, with a couple of notable exceptions. Perhaps because the tea, which was vicious and acrid and unexpectedly sweet, makes its alien presence felt in your stomach and intestines, ayahuasca is a more bodily experience than some other psychedelics. I did not get sick, but I was very much aware of the thick brew moving through me and, as the effect of DMT, ayahuasca's active ingredient, came on, imagined it as a vine winding its way through the curls and convolutions of my intestines, occupying my body before slowly working its snake-like way up to and into my head. There followed a great many memories and images, some horrifying, others magnificent. But I want to describe one in particular, because although I don't completely understand it, it captures something that psychedelics have taught me, something important. Because there was still some light in the room when, when the ceremony began, <clears throat> we were all wearing eye masks, and mine felt a little tight around my head. Early in the journey, I became aware of the black straps circling my skull, and these morphed into bars. My head was caged in steel. The bars then began to multiply, moving down from my head to encircle my torso and then my legs. I was now trapped head to toe in a black steel cage. I pressed against the bars, but they were unyielding. There was no way out. Panic was building when I noticed the green tip of a vine at the base of the cage. It was growing steadily upward and then turning, sinuously, to slip out between two of the bars, freeing itself and at the same time reaching toward the light. A plant can't be caged, I heard myself thinking. Only an animal can be caged. I can't tell you what this means, if anything. Was the plant showing me a way out? Perhaps, but it's not as if I could actually follow it. I am an animal after all. Yet it seemed the plant was trying to teach me something, that it was proposing a kind of visual koan for me to unpack, and I have been turning it over in my head ever since. Maybe it was a lesson about the folly of approaching an obstacle head-on, that sometimes the answer is not the application of force, but rather changing the terms of the problem in such a way that it loses its dominion without actually crumbling. It felt like some kind of jujitsu. Because the vine wasn't just escaping the confines of the cage, it was using the structure to improve its situation, climbing higher to gather more light for itself. Or maybe the lesson was more universal, Something about plants themselves and how we underestimate them. My plant teacher, as I began to think of the vine, was trying to tell me something about itself and the green kingdom it represents. A kingdom that has always figured largely in my work and my imagination. That plants are intelligent I have believed for a long time. Not necessarily in the way we think of intelligence, <clears throat> but in a way appropriate to themselves. We can do many things plants can't, Yet they can do all sorts of things we can't, escaping from steel cages, for example, or eating sunlight. <clears throat> if you define intelligence as the ability to solve the novel problems reality throws at the living, plants surely have it. They also possess agency, an awareness of their environment, and a kind of subjectivity, a set of interests they pursue, and so a point of view. But though these are all ideas I have long believed and am happy to defend, Never have I felt them to be true, to be as deeply rooted as I did after my psychedelic journeys. The uncageable vine reminded me of that first psilocybin trip, <clears throat> when I felt the leaves and plants in the garden returning my gaze. One of the gifts of psychedelics is the way they reanimate the world, as if they were distributing the blessings of consciousness more widely <clears throat> and even evenly over the landscape, 
in the process breaking the human monopoly on subjectivity that we moderns take as a given. To us, we are the world's only conscious subjects, with the rest of creation made up of objects. To the more egotistical among us, even other people count as objects. Psychedelic consciousness overturns that view by granting us a wider, more generous lens through which we can glimpse the subjecthood, the spirit, of everything. Animal, vegetable, even mineral. All of it now somehow returning our gaze. Spirits, it seems, are everywhere. New rays of relation appear between us and all the world's others. <clears throat> Even in the case of minerals, modern physics, forget psychedelics, gives us reason to wonder if perhaps... Quantum mechanics holds that matter may not be as innocent of mind as the materialist would have us believe. For example, a subatomic particle can exist simultaneously in multiple locations, is pure possibility, until it is measured, that is perceived, that is, perceived by a mind. Only then, and not a moment sooner, does it drop into reality as we know it, acquire fixed coordinates in time and space. The implication here is that matter might not exist as such in the absence of a perceiving subject. Needless to say, this raises some tricky questions for a materialist understanding of consciousness. The ground underfoot may, not, may be much less solid than we think. This is the view of quantum physics, not some psychonaut, though it is a very psychedelic theory. I mention it only because it lends some of the authority of science to speculations that would otherwise sound utterly lunatic. I still tend to think that consciousness must be confined to brains, but I am less certain of this belief now than I was before I embarked on this journey. Maybe it too has slipped out from between the bars of that cage. Mysteries abide. But this I can say with certainty. The mind is vaster and the world ever so much more alive than I knew when I began. So that's that. It's the end of the book, How to Change Your Mind, The New Science of Psychedelics by Michael Pollan. And wow, what a book. May I just say, if there's one book that I'd highly recommend people read this year, uh, it'll be that one for sure. It's just enlightening on the subject of <clears throat> psychedelics and plant medicine and you know I've always had a I've never felt right with the way mess uh, the way western medicine is set up right now I just you know big pharma um, and these massive organizations that seem to just be you know chewing out the uh, the the pills and like the antidepressants and the the all these different types of medicine medicine that uh people take and we don't really know the long-term side effects of these antidepressants and uh anti-anxiety medications and all these things they've only been on the scene a lot of a lot of these new uh drugs have only been on the scene for 20 to 50 years really and people uh, put on them and f for life. And he mentioned in this book, uh, he mentions that, you know, there's been a lot of studies done on different antidepressants, and the majority of them, it's roughly around a 5%, 5 to 10% of people actually make a recovery from their depression by taking antidepressants. That's really quite a low statistic. Like, I think that's not very good, really. And the majority of people who take psychedelics, like the, these depressed people who go and have, whether it be an MDMA journey or a psilocybin experience um, or LSD, whatever it may be, uh, these people seem to be being cured at least temporarily. Like for at least six to 12 months, these people have zero depression and like, the, the major the overwhelming majority of these people and how is that not super promising for the future and how is this not now how are psychedelics not now already being administered on a mass basis instead of these uh, antidepressant pills and medications that people are prescribed by the majority of their gps and psychiatrists it just baffles me but I can understand it because obviously big pharma 
you know, you only have, you only need to have one or one or maybe two of these psychedelic journeys for you to, for the depression to be almost totally eradicated or alleviated to some degree. And how is Big Pharma to profit from just giving people one dose of a plant medicine? And how are they supposed to regulate and, you know, profit from that? And that's what they're clearly all about. They're all about the money and the profit at the expense of the major of the expense of millions of people's health because you know look at the statistics on opiate uh, addictions and these uh oxycodone and oxycontin and um percocets and um all these different pills that people are overdosing on every day especially in america it's, it's just overwhelming and yet they're still prescribing them on a mass basis and they're super easy to get and yet psychedelics have been proven now to have a much higher success rate for actually getting to the root cause of these people's symptoms and over and helping them to overcome their depression or their anxiety or their trauma and i think surely surely there's a way for us to be able to incorporate this plant medicine into society because it clearly is the medicine of the future. As long as it's like he talks a lot about set and setting. So when we're consuming these medicines, it's very important for us to be in a safe setting and a and a comfortable place with people we trust. Because you know, obviously, we're we're entering these states of consciousness where we're not fully in the uh, we're not fully aware of our reality around us physically where we go into this mental realm of you know people go on trips and come back and report all sorts of things that they've seen god or they've you know touched the divine or um you know they've they saw like a, an ancient relative of theirs or a past a, a relative has passed on and they communicated with all these types of things and and they can really go and in, tap into um healing their past traumas by really opening their mind up to allow them to visit the space that they need to visit and they've been maybe suppressing or holding back from wanting to visit in their ordinary state of consciousness for so long. And so to me, the the whole psychedelic experience and the whole concept of psychedelics is very exciting and I believe we need to find a way to implement and incorporate these medicines into society because there are so many people out there suffering from all sorts of conditions and mental health problems and mental health uh, issues are just only increasing. So I believe they just it's absolutely essential for us to incorporate them. And anyway, that'll pretty much do me for today, but I'd love to know what you guys have to think about that or have to say about that. If you could even put, like comment on here or just, I'd love to know your thoughts on this and um, what's your opinion on the matter. So anyway, thank you very much for listening and I'll catch you next time. Goodbye.